and uh, we will we will start with the um, that we will hold our seminars at 8 a.m. on West Coast uh, California time on the first Mondays of each month. And so next month will be November the 1st, uh, four weeks from now. And we have uh, two great speakers uh, lined up uh, for that. Um, uh, Roger Kornberg, whom Wa may, may uh, say a little bit more about, and, uh, and Hamish Fraser from uh, Ohio State. So uh, uh, I'm very pleased about today's uh, speakers. Um, we have uh, two of the PICO honorees from recent years uh, speaking. And uh, one thing I might say about November 1st, as, I, as people are entering, is that please remember that uh, the clocks do not go back in America until the first weekend of November, whereas in Europe, they will have gone back at the last weekend of October. So there will be a, a time differential uh, for, uh, between us uh, for the November meeting, but then we'll be back uh, on, in synchronization with the nine hour difference between Central European time and West Coast time uh, after that. So without further ado, I want to pass it on to Wa, who will uh, introduce our first speaker. Please, Professor Chu. All right, thank you very much, uh, Bob. Uh, I would like to extend my welcome to the speakers and also all the audience around the group. Today is my very pleasure to introduce Professor Wugen Baumeister from the Max Bahn Institute of Biochemistry in Martin Street, which is just outside Munich in Germany. I know Wugen for many, many years, and we have had lots of great time in many, many ways. And Wugen is a very well-known structural biologist who is really fluent in both crystallography as well as electron microscopy. Wugen has received many, many prestigious awards, just too many to mention, throughout Europe, Southeast Asia, and United States. He is an elected member of the EMBO in Europe, and also the National Academy of Sciences in the United States of America. Wu Gan is known for his initiations of the idea using Yetan tomography to look at molecules and biological events in cells, from bacteria to mammalian cells in a vitrified state. So his idea has been extremely exciting in the recent years because the development of many hardware and software in cryo electron microscopy. He has led a team of very talented uh, scientists in Max Planck for many, many method development in the electron cryotomography, ranging from sample preparation and advanced optics to enhance image contours. Today is my great pleasure to uh, to invite uh, Wu Gan to talk to us to share his most recent work. His lecture title is Structural Biology in Situ. Wu Gan, thank you for coming. Thank you very much, Wa, for <clears throat> the invitation. It would be much more fun to be there in person, <clears throat> um, but also for your very kind introduction. So I think I should share my screen now. And Okay, you should, you should see it, right? Yes, we see it well, thank you. As Val said, I will talk about structural biology in C2 or the power of seeing the whole picture. Now, why do we want to, um, to do structural biology in C2? I mean, <clears throat> I think what structural biologists do traditionally is to approach cellular complexity in a reductionist manner. Cells are taken apart, <clears throat> the molecular components are fractionated, they are purified, and then they are studied one by one using the established methods of structural biology. There's no doubt that if you look at the PDB that this approach, I mean this divide and conquer approach has been very successful. But it's also clear that very rarely biological functions or cellular functions can be attributed to individual molecules. Cellular functions arise from the interaction between the many molecular species inhabiting a cell and acting in concert. 
And structural biology in C2 aims at studying macromolecular, supramolecular structures in their functional context that is inside ideally unperturbed cellular environments. The method that allows doing that is cryo-electron tomography. I don't think there's any need to introduce here the principles of tomographic data acquisition or of tomographic reconstruction. Um, Sufficient to say that cryo-ET combines the best possible structural preservation of cells, of cellular structures, with the power of three-dimensional imaging. Now, I should say that the idea to do electron tomography, I mean, is not a new idea. There was a remarkable paper published, well, more than 50 years ago in Science by Roger Hart. He was at Livermore. And the, his paper was entitled Electron Microscopy of Unstained Biological Material, the Polytropic Montage. Now, as you read the abstract, it's clear that the polytropic montage is synonymous to tomography. And the last word of the abstract, last uh, sentence of the abstract says, preliminary results indicate that one may thus study unstained, unshadowed biological material at high resolution. In spite of all the vision he had, I mean, <clears throat> his work and this paper um, have, has received very moderate attention. The reason was basically that the only application he was able to show at that time was that of a freeze-dried cell. <clears throat> and as a matter of fact, there were no recognizable features at the time. Of course, the main problem in doing cryo-electron tomography, doing tomography of biological material is the radiation sensitivity of biological material. It was clear that <clears throat> to us when we began to work on it in the late 80s, that I think the only solution would be dose fractionation. That means distributing the total allowable electron dose over as many projections as possible. <clears throat> and that can only be done and achieved by automating, I mean, data acquisition. So we began to work on that at a time when let's say, I mean, goniometers were all operated by, by hand, not motor-driven. CCD cameras were still, I mean, relatively um, yeah, low quality. But I mean, we um, back then in, <clears throat> in 1992, we could show that the cumulative dose in collecting tomographic 3D data sets can indeed be kept small enough for the investigation of ice embedded specimens. So what you see here, that is <clears throat> first tomographic application to something extremely simple, lipid vesicles embedded in ice, but it was a kind of a breakthrough at the time. I mean, at that point in time, many people thought this was, the problems would be unsurmountable. Now for quite a long time in the early days of <clears throat> electron tomography, we were limited to studying very small objects, such as virus particles. That is some work we did at the time with Alistair Steven from the NIH on herpes simplex virus. It showed the power of the method already, but I'm showing it also to make the point that even though, I mean, tomograms are necessarily because of the dose limitations pretty noisy, you can improve the quality once you have repetitive features inside your tomograms. And the repetitive feature is here seen on the top, that is the nuclear capsid of the herpes simplex virus. And it was clear that one could extract that and could computationally average that and then put it back into context, precisely into context, something that is now common practice <clears throat> and, and called subvolume or subtomogram averaging. Now, the biggest hurdle for a long time to deal with real biological <clears throat> problems was specimen thickness. I mean, it basically, I think a sample in ice that should be studied by tomography should not be thicker than half a micrometer. We began to work, and we are still working, on rot photoreceptor cells from the retina, here of the mouse retina. You see this columns here in, in purple. <clears throat> and we are particularly interested in the molecular architecture of what is called the rot outer segment which is, I mean, an array of disks, membrane disks here with very high supramolecular, I mean, very high order. <clears throat> and 
that is where the visual pigment rhodopsin is located. And we would like to study what is the organization of rhodopsin inside these uh, rod outer segment membranes. Now, we made a first attempt something like 15 years ago. That is what you see on the right hand side. And even though these rod outer photoreceptor cells are relatively thin, something like one micrometer, and as they <clears throat> are prepared, they become a little bit flattened. Still, I think only they are kind of semi-transparent. So the biggest challenge was, I mean, to find a way of, I mean, uh, sample preparation of thinning the samples, I mean, without um, causing any serious artifacts. I mean, <clears throat> people had proposed, I mean, Jacques Dubergy, for instance, to use um, um, a cryomicrotome. It can be done. But if applied to vitrified samples, and then I mean, the ice is pretty compressible and you get compressions up to 40%. So you get very serious deformation of the molecular, the supramolecular structures in, inside your sample. So we put our money into developing a focused ion beam milling. So basically we use a dual beam instrument, the SAM, which is used in, in order to monitor, I mean, and to target the right region in a way. But then we have a focused beam, a gallium beam for ablating material and for local thinning. And that allows us to make thin compression-free windows into the cell. Many different geometries one can use. <clears throat> one can, I mean, cut basically a wedge. That is what people do often with, let's say, the bacterial cells or something thinner. <clears throat> but we can all, what we do most of the time, and that has again become common practice, is we ablate material from above and below the region of interest. So, I mean, we have a thin lamella that is supported only by the surrounding ice. Now, uh, one should say that, of course, cryotomography has, like single particle analysis, benefited enormously from various technology developments on the microscope side. <clears throat> I mean, that is, I mean, uh, it was a big step forward when microscopes became available with auto loaders and, and many other features. I mean, automating the entire process of data acquisition an awful lot. So throughput was increased. There was consistent, more consistent quality of the, of, the, of the data. Then of course, a big game changer was I mean, when we transitioned from, <clears throat> from um, to, to direct detectors. But there are also other devices, not yet perfect, but still useful, like faceplates. I will briefly elaborate on that. That was, I mean, the work of Radostin Danev in, in the lab. It has been a dream in, <clears throat> in electron microscopy from the very early days, as a matter of fact, to be able to generate face contrast in focus. I mean, if you take an image in focus, in conventional microscope, I mean, there is hardly any contrast. So contrast is generated by defocusing. And you see, I mean, the result is a weird contrast transfer function with resulting in a ghostly image. That is the kind of image we would like to have the equivalent of the Cernica faceplate and light microscopy. There have been attempts, early attempts by Kuniyaki Nagayama's lab in Japan to with a kind of a Cernica faceplate and electron microscopy, but that was, I mean, changed properties over time. Or, and I mean, there were fringes very disturbing. So I think the Volta faceplate was a step forward, even though it is not the perfect solution. Ideally, we don't want to have any mass in the beam here, but <clears throat> you will see in the next images, it can be very helpful in tomography because in tomography, unlike single particle analysis, our options for averaging are much more limited. So on the left-hand side, we come back now to the rod outer segment of the photoreceptor cell. That is, I mean, an image without face plate and with a focus of minus three micrometers. And on the right-hand side is um, the same area now <clears throat> in, with, with the face plate in focus. Now, why is it important? I mean, we were interested here in the very delicate features um, which maintain the uh, supramolecular order, I mean, the precise stacking of all these membranes in the photoreceptor cells. And these are these um, spacers which maintain that. There are two kinds of spacers and they're still working on the molecular structure of these spacers. They are pretty flexible, they are very thin, and they just were escape tension <clears throat> in conventional microscopy without the faceplate. 
The real goal of this project is much more ambitious and we are still far away from, from reaching the goal. That is basically, as I said, the supramolecular organization of rhodopsin inside the membranes. And for that, we have still have to optimize algorithms for the detection of rhodopsin density in membrane bilayers, or I mean, combining cluster analysis in detection algorithms with subtomogram averaging here. We are making some progress. I think we, the idea is that the most likely scenario is that rhodopsin forms dimers here that interact with red arestine, et cetera. We have now a decent structure of rhodopsin dimers, which can be used as a kind of, as a template, but we are still not there. Now, coming to a project that is brought to some conclusion and uh, <clears throat> not yet underway, that is the work of Julia Mahamid, <clears throat> looking at the molecular architecture at the, um, <clears throat> at, um, the HeLa cell nuclei, nuclear periphery. So that is basically the workflow top left. We have, I mean, the HeLa cell, the nucleus is stained here. <clears throat> that is the SEM image here. Then we cut a lamella and that is the lamella which we can transfer now into the microscope. Now we take tomograms from, I mean, <clears throat> that cover basically the inside of the, of the nucleus and we go to the surface of the nucleus. So inside we are in the region of the heterochromatin here. What you see here are nucleosomes, which you can pick up very nicely and very easily. You can get decent averages of these nucleosomes, which I mean, which are relatively small, 200 kilodalton going to a resolution of at least 10 angstroms. But what we cannot really do, and we are still lacking the image processing tools to achieve that establishing unambiguously um, the connectivity between nucleosomes here. That would be important in order to understand, basically, I mean, the organization of chromatin. Now, <clears throat> as we approach the, um, the nuclear envelope, we come to the region where the nuclear lamina, a fine meshwork of intermediate filaments is located. Then we have, of course, I mean, in the nuclear envelope, we have nuclear pores. Here first we start <clears throat> inside the nucleus, then we are now on the cytoplasmic side. And at the bottom, we are now on the surface of the nucleus, which is covered with, <clears throat> with ribosomes forming polysomes, with actin filaments, microtubules, etc. Now we can do a great deal of image processing here. I think there are now relatively powerful methods for the segmentation of filamentous structures, be it actin, the lamina filaments or microtubules. Now, <clears throat> then we have the nuclear pore complex. The top row is, I mean, the image taken without the faceplate. At the bottom with the faceplate here, that is an average. It's not yet, I mean, very high resolution as a matter of fact, but it's remarkable because it's an average over only a handful of nuclear pore complexes. And we think it's important to push it further, the quality of the original tomograms, so that we can, at the end of the day, I mean, obtain structures of that kind from individual nuclear pore complexes, because, I mean, we have a great deal of variation in the structure. The diameter alone can change something by 13% in different functional states, which always coexist. And on the surface, we have the ribosomes, as I said, and I mean, it's, it's relatively, it's always easy to, to deal with ribosomes <clears throat> that you can easily average them. That is now a synopsis of <clears throat> this study of Yulia Mahamid. <clears throat> Again, you see in the background the heterochromatin, the fine meshwork of the nuclear lamina, the nuclear pore complexes, and here we are on the surface and you see these rows of polysomes sitting there. Now, <clears throat> I will show you a couple of examples from work with, I mean, a small algae, Chlamydomonas. Chlamydomonas is, um, has become a kind of a model organism for tomography for two reasons. Reason number one is it's a little bit less crowded than let's say a yeast cell. And genetics is nevertheless very well established in all aspects. But the second more important aspect is that it has in terms of the topology of the organelles, a very well defined, almost deterministic topology. So you know, a priori where let's say, um, 
a Golgi apparatus is located. And you can very easily zoom in on that region. So what you see on the left-hand side, the tomogram of this region, which is boxed here, you see here the nuclear envelope, and this is the region of a nuclear pore complex. And so you can pick <clears throat> many of those and create a decent average, as you will see in a minute. This here is a beautiful image of the, <clears throat> of the Golgi apparatus. This here is endoplasmic reticulum studied with ribosomes. So we can study ribosomes sitting on the ER, sitting on the translocon for import of <clears throat> um, the translation product into the ER. So the next slide shows an average, again, over a fairly limited number of copies, 300 or something like that of the nuclear pore complex, showing in red already very nicely the, the shape and the structure of um, the so-called Y complex, which is a key component of the nuclear pore complex, and as such, highly conserved among species. <clears throat> then I think, well, since ribosomes are abundant, without pushing the envelope at that time, that is a couple of years old. I mean, we reached a resolution of something like eight, eight and a half angstroms. Now that is a ribosome sitting on the translocon or the SEC61 protein conducting channel here. And so we can zoom on the membrane part of, of this channel here and zoom in and you see Again, I mean, um, resolution is good enough, probably in the region of something like seven angstroms. So we see the helices very clearly here. I think some very recent work just published, we looked into ribosome biogenesis, which takes place in the nucleolus, inside the nucleus. <clears throat> and so you see basically waves of pre-ribosome particles, I mean, emerging from the so-called granular phase of the nucleolus. <clears throat> we can distinguish between pre-60S ribosomes and, I mean, small subunit processosomes. So intermediates in, I mean, the maturation of, of ribosomes in situ. And it's very interesting to see, I mean, how that is spatially organized. Now, <clears throat> the methods I described, I mean, used all lamella, as I described before. But that does not work if we want to, to target <clears throat> the volumes deep inside um, so, uh, well, multicellular organisms or tissues. So we developed an approach that allows doing that. And I think I should run the movie probably again. Basically, basically we cut with the iron beam vertically into, in this case, I mean, a region here in, <clears throat> in um, C. elegans here targeting cells in the gut of C. elegans. Then, I mean, we have to, to cut this lamella free. It is initially something like two micrometers in thickness. We have to transfer it to another holder so that, that we can do further thinning down to something like 300 nanometers here, and then we can take the tomographs. The procedure looks a bit complicated. It is still not as reliable as it should be ideally, but it works nevertheless, at least in the hands of experts quite well. So you see here on the right hand side, a slice to a tomogram in a region of this gut cell deep inside C. elegans here. So you, what you see here are coated vesicles. Here you see a ribosome sitting here on the, on the ER. That is a cross section through a microtubule. Now, again, we can do <clears throat> averaging and we can do some classification. In, in the course of doing the averaging, we can quite easily dist distinguish between two states, which are different stages in the translational cycle of, of the ribosome. And we can distinguish them by the occupancy of tRNA here. And we can color code the two different states here and see how they are distributed in the cell. So the procedure works, but I mean, it is still, um, the success rate is probably something like 30, 40%. Now, I think in the following, I will talk about the opponent of the ribosome, that is the proteasome, and that has been, from a biological perspective, the main interest of my lab over the past uh, 25, 30 years almost. The proteasome is a large macromolecular complex. It works at the executive end of the so-called ubiquitin proteasome system. Ubiquitin is a small molecule that is used to target proteins for degradation. So once they carry ubiquitin or 
a polyubiquitin chain, <clears throat> they are recognized by the proteasome and then they are degraded. The proteasome as such is a completely non-specific protease, <clears throat> but I mean, uh, specificity is conferred by the ubiquitin system. So it's a multi-subunit complex of 34 uh, subunits. <clears throat> and I think that is, is almost 10 years old, a little bit older. At that time, we were limited in resolution to something like eight, nine angstroms here. That was not sufficient to interpret the map in terms of the molecular architecture. So we had to use an orthogonal approach. We used cross-linking in conjunction with mass spec, I mean, to get um, distance restraints for the interpretation. Well, that was quite a challenge and was done in collaboration with Andre Charlie of UCSF. But it turned out the model we came up with stood the test of time. I think I will go now. I leave tomography for two or three minutes and, and explain to you the basic organization of, of the proteasome. I think, again, I should start this movie again. So, I mean, it has a core particle. That is where protein degradation takes place in the cavity here where the active sites are located. So any substrate to be degraded has to be translocated into the interior of this core complex here. And that requires to team up with a regulatory particle, one or two regulatory particles. Their role is to recognize ubiquitinated proteins, to remove ubiquitin, then to unfold them and to assist in their translocation into the core complex. Now that is a fairly complex functional cycle, <clears throat> which you will see in a minute. I will not go into details here. <clears throat> I show it just to make the point that the conformational changes during the functional cycles are of such a magnitude that even at lower resolution, as we can achieve in tomography currently, you can. <clears throat> infer from I amine mean, the conformation at what stage of the functional cycle we are. <clears throat> so that is the molecule, the regulatory particle in the ground state. Then it has to, I mean, there are large rotations of, I mean, several subunits here to bring the substrate down from the receptors to the mouth of the AAA ATPase, which serves to unfold by pushing, I mean, the molecule through a channel here. And then, I mean, there's also a lateral shift here, which allows to align the, the gate that controls access to the core particle with the channel where the unfolding takes place. So we have very large conformational changes. As I said, something like 25, 30 degrees rotations, but also, I mean, lateral shifts. Now, coming back to the in situ situation, where are in our Chlamydomonas cell <clears throat> the proteasomes located? Now that is told, informed us by, <clears throat> by uh, fluorescence light microscopy here. You see in green here in this column here, the locations of, of the proteasomes. They are labeled with, with GFP here. So that is the nucleus here. So, I mean, they are lining basically the inner, the, the nuclear envelope from inside the nucleus. And then we have these bright spots here, which are located near the Golgi apparatus and the endoplasmic reticulum. So <clears throat> in the next step, we zoomed in on these regions in the cell. On the left-hand side, you see some of the raw data, a slice here. And even in the raw data, I think you can already recognize the basic features of the proteasome. You see the core complex, the regulatory particles, et cetera, et cetera. Now you can, of course, extract them computationally and then create a first average at intermediate resolution. Now, <clears throat> then you can do, of course, a classification of proteasomes. You can distinguish between those, I mean, that carry a single regulatory particle or two regulatory particles at each end of the core complex. We can, as I said, infer from, I mean, the conformation, whether a given particle is in the ground state, not dealing with substrate, or whether it's in the substrate processing state, degrading substrates. We can also see what are the interactors in situ, whether they are interacting with membranes and at what site, or whether, I mean, they are <clears throat> interacting with certain features of the nuclear pore complex. And we can very nicely quantify that. So say here, for instance, um, two thirds um, uh, have two regulatory particles. We can say that, I mean, 
two thirds are in the ground state and only something like one quarter is degrading substrate in this given scenario. Now, the nice feature is that we can map these different classes back to the original tomogram. What you see here is on the left-hand side, the nuclear region. This is the cytoplasm that is a mitochondrion. That is a nuclear pore complex. Now, the, the average of the nuclear pore complex, we can distinguish between single capped and double capped ones. We, we can say, where are those in the ground state? Where are those in the substrate processing state? We can say which one is tethered to the membrane and which one is tethered to the so-called nuclear basket. So that is a more in-depth analysis now. If we look at those that are associated with the nuclear pore complex, we have again two subpopulations here. One population in red, I mean, that is interacting essentially with the well, it's close to the level of the membrane. It interacts with the membrane at the periphery of the nuclear pore complex. And this population in yellow here <clears throat> is further away from the membrane level. It interacts, as you see here, with, I mean, which is not visible here because the nuclear, the nuclear, uh, the nuclear basket is a very flexible structure here, but that is the site where the nuclear basket is. <clears throat> now, so that is, summarized here schematically. So we have these two subpopulations which are functionally distinct. They are involved in surveillance of import export. <clears throat> this population here is, has a role in maintaining the distinct protein compositions here of the outer and inner uh, leaflet of the nuclear envelope. <clears throat> then I said there, is, there are two um, locations in the cytoplasm of <clears throat> of this algae where I mean, we find basically all the, <clears throat> the proteasomes clustered. That is on the ER. I mean, ribosomes are sitting on the ER, they translocate the product into the ER where they are supposed to fold properly with the assistance of, of chaperones, but that can go wrong. It often goes wrong under stress conditions. And so there must be a system to get to clear, <clears throat> I mean, the misfolded proteins in the ER, that is the so-called well, unfolded protein response. Now, <clears throat> there's no powerful degradation system inside the ER. Therefore, they have to be retrotranslocated into the cytoplasm. That is where the proteasomes are, and they then degrade the, <clears throat> um, the retrotranslocated misfolded proteins. Now, this system has been studied extensively. There are, I think, roughly 1,000 publications of this pathway, but the molecular organization, I mean, was pretty much unknown. Now, here we look now into various parts of, of very um, um, endoplasmic reticulum sites here. And what you see in red, I mean, in blue, in, in light blue, these are free ribosomes in dark blue, these are ribosomes associated tethered to the membrane. And in red, this is, I mean, these are clusters of proteasomes sitting on the ER. So we can do a deep analysis of that. That requires a molecule by molecule analysis of the tomograms. I'm not going to talk about template matching, which I mean is a method um, often somewhat tricky to use, but I mean, it didn't play a role here. So what we have done is we have basically picked in these clusters all the densities we could find. I mean, <clears throat> similar to methods being used in single particle analysis. Then we did a classification and we obtained two separate classes here, where, which we could average separately <clears throat> according to the similarity. Now, this is now the visualization of an ERAT cluster here. There are basically in these clusters, two molecular species in red, I mean the proteasomes in yellow. This is, I mean, an ATPA is called CDC48. It's implicated in the retrotranslocation, but you see very nicely here the cluster, which is devoid of ribosomes. This is a polysome here, sitting here on, on the endoplasmic reticulum. <clears throat> now we can do, a somewhat more detailed analysis of <clears throat> such a cluster. 
They can look for assembly states, I mean, single double capped. They can look into functional states, ground states, substrate processing states, very similar to what I described before in the nucleus. Now, <clears throat> the interesting thing is that, I mean, if we look now at proteasomes sitting very close to the membrane, then you see 50% here, I mean, of those basically touching the membrane are substrate processing. We can create an average of that one and we see additional density here, which makes us believe that the proteasome itself, and that had been hypothesized also before, but never been shown, is involved in the retrotranslocation of substrate. So basically we think that suggests that we have what we call direct errat in which the, the proteasomes, I mean, pull out essentially <clears throat> uh, misfolded proteins from the ER and indirect errat where they degrade, I mean, substrate that has been extracted by CDC 48. In the next couple of minutes, I will talk a major, about a major project we have been working on in recent years as a collaborator collaborative project funded by an ERC synergy grant. <clears throat> My colleague Ulrich Hartl is interested in how do aggregates affect proteostasis <clears throat> inside cells and can we boost the cellular defenses against aggregation? So toxic protein aggregation, I mean, is of course the hallmark of neurotoxic, <clears throat> of neurodegeneration. My colleague Matthias Mann, an expert in proteomics, is interested what is the composition of the aggregates? How does the cellular proteome change in response to toxic aggregation? And our interest is what is the in situ structure of the aggregates and how do they interact with the cellular environment? So we began um, by looking at, um, I mean, <clears throat> Huntington's disease. I mean, Huntington, I think, as, as you all know, is a terrible muscle coordination defect. It's caused by um, a poly-Q, polyglutamine expansion here at, at the end terminus of the Huntington molecule. That is the Huntington molecule. I mean, it has taken us five years to determine the atomic structure. It's an extremely flexible molecule and it worked only after we found, I mean, a natural interactor HUB40 that stabilizes the conformation. But it did not, I mean, reveal any clue about its, its, um, its um, toxic mechanism, basically. So <clears throat> it is only clear that if that polyglutamine repeat becomes longer than 36 or so residues, then I think the, the protein becomes unstable and it forms an aggregate. How does the aggregate look like? Now that is um, required a fairly complex workflow. Of course, always the first step is vitrification. Then, I mean, <clears throat> a neuron is a large landscape compared with the field of view of tomography. And not every cell <clears throat> that we grow, every neuron we grow in the grid, then contains, I mean, a hunting team aggregate. So we have to identify cells that carry such an inclusion, and we have to target that very specifically <clears throat> by focus on beam milling and then transfer it to. Um, the microscope. Now that is the result. You see now a tomogram of a hunting teen aggregate, a relatively small hunting teen aggregate. So something like um, a micron or a bit more in diameter. In blue, you see the hunting teen fibrils, which are three, four nanometers. And what we see immediately is that they interact destructively with their cellular environment. What you see in red is fragmented endoplasmic reticulum. I mean, it breaks down. We don't understand the mechanism fully, but it seems whenever a hunting team fibril, that is what we observe also in vitro, touches upon, I mean, a membrane or a vesicle, it changes dramatically the curvature of the membrane locally, and that eventually leads to disruption. And as a consequence of that, the ribosomes are liberated and they are kept completely outside. There's no population of molecules, really, of macromolecules inside the hunting team aggregate. The next example is um, from, I mean, um, basically the system that causes ALS. This results from hexanucleotide expansion in this gene here. There could be a loss of function due to this mutation, but I think what it does for sure is, I mean, it results, it, it translates 
into toxic E-peptide repeats. And what is found in the patients, in the brains of patients suffering from those diseases is mostly polyglycine alanine repeat, as it's shown here. So we had, again, a model system in which we expressed this um, a, a protein, I mean, with, with such a repeat. And then we did the same procedure with the grid then we identified by GFP, a neuron that contains, <clears throat> I mean, Huntington, the Huntington aggregate. We target that aggregate now with focus ion beam. And here you see the lamella, and we can confirm that <clears throat> it contains the, the aggregate material, and we can zoom in by tomography. Now, <clears throat> what you see here is, again, the tomogram now of the polyglycine alanine aggregate in a primary neuron. At a glance, it might look similar to hunting team, but I think you might see, you will see these are not fibrils. They are polymorphic ribbons, often bifurcated, as you will see in, in the segmented version in a minute. But you also see that we have numerous particles in between um, the, um, the, in between the, the um, aggregate material. Now, <clears throat> that is now the interpretation, basically, after doing, again, the molecule by molecule analysis. You see in red the aggregate material. And as I said, these are not fibrils. These are ribbons here. You see that, again, I mean, ribosomes cannot enter. They are excluded from, from the volume of the aggregate material. In purple, you see here the chaperone that works downstream of the, um, of the ribosome. Rival remember trick here, but again, it's excluded. Basically, we have a single molecular species filling all the space in the aggregate material, and that is the 26S protosome. Now, <clears throat> we can, since we have here enough copies, we can push resolution relatively far something like 10 angstroms here, we can do a classification and you see very clearly, I mean, in the green, that is the ground state. In the blue, that is the substrate processing state. Resolution is a little bit lower here because we have fewer um, protosomes in the substrate processing state. You see, we have some additional mass here, not accounted for by the mass of the proteasome itself here, which we tentatively interpreted as substrate. And we can show that also directly when we map now back to the tomogram. <clears throat> the, the blue guys, the blue guys are the subtract processing ones and invariably they interact directly with the aggregate material. It's basically that <clears throat> the proteasome tries to degrade the aggregate material, but um, I mean the, the lysine alanine repeat has a silk-like architecture and it cannot be unfolded. So the proteasome becomes stalled and I mean, the pool of proteasomes needed by the cell to maintain proteostasis becomes completely depleted. Now, that is now basically the Parkinson case and where we look at the nuclei in a relatively small uh, molecule that controls, I mean, <clears throat> dopamine release here. And you see, I mean, in the tomogram here, we have again the fibrils. We can show that the fibrils are indeed the nuclein because they are covered here with uh, GFP. And <clears throat> again, the phenotype is quite different. They crisscross, I mean, the, the cytoplasm, and we have remnants of all sorts of or, uh, organelles here. I think towards the end, very briefly, I mean, what are the perspectives of cryoelectron tomography? And we had a slightly provocative title on the paper that I published with Martin Beck some time ago. Can it reveal the molecular sociology of cells in atomic detail? <clears throat> I mean, not just, I mean, ticking molecules which are abundant and pushing resolution, but I mean, really visualizing the context in the atomic resolution. I think to achieve that, we have to realize the full potential of cryo-ET. Uh, there are a couple of points I want to make. I think focused ion beam is still terribly slow. It, um, you can prepare <clears throat> six, seven lamella per day, but I mean, it's a real bottleneck. And I think there will be a next generation of focused ion beam using a plasma, <clears throat> a plasma fit that should be 10 to 20 times faster. I think that is very important for throughput. As I mentioned before, lift out technology 
um, is still needs to, to be automated and improved. I think it's, it's still, uh, the workflow is unnecessarily complicated because I mean, we have to transfer things from, I mean, a light microscope to the focused ion beam. I think it's, we are arguing since many years that this should be integrated. And I think the, the light microscopy should be super resolution in, in a combined light microscope ion beam instrument. I think we don't need really the, the SEM. But I mean, that is, we have inherited that from the material scientists in a way <clears throat> that there are now numerous activities, but there will also be a commercial situ uh, solution to, to an integrated instrument. I think we would like, of course, uh, that is uh, following up on that, narrow down the resolution gap between cryo-EM and cryolite microscopy. I mean, light microscopy is very powerful in identifying things. So I mean, we can use the GFP and other, <clears throat> and other um, labels easily, genetically encoded labels, and we can, I mean, then identify things. And so ideally, we would like to, to be able to superimpose cryolite microscopy on the image on, <clears throat> on the tomogram with high precision. I think there's still, I mean, the, the problem of, I mean, um, specimen motion. And I think um, there are pretty good computation solutions uh, to compensate for that and to recover high resolution information. But I think it would be good if we could, I mean, deal with that experimentally. I think we have seen many improvements of cameras in recent years, but they are still not yet at the physical limits. And as I mentioned also, I think the, the current face-based solutions are not yet such satisfactory. And so we all look forward to the laser faceplate developed uh, under development in Berkeley. I think also, I think much can be gained from more powerful um, image processing methods for mining the rich information of tomograms using deep learning for segmentation. We need template-free methods for particle detection and sorting. <clears throat> and I think here artificial intelligence can help a lot. I think it's still, I think it will not be possible for the foreseeable future, I mean, to map all the smaller molecules in the cellular context. But I think we should do what we have done with macromolecular structures in 10 years ago, basically use orthogonal complementary information that comes from mass spectrometry, protein stoichiometry, we should use, I mean, in vivo cross-linking and mass spec, I mean, to to have, I mean, distance restraints and then use that to model the environment, I mean, around, I mean, larger proteins which can serve as anchor points. That, so I think this is my final, almost final slide. I think it's a citation from the mathematician Freeman Dyson. New direction signs are launched by new tools much more often than by new concepts. The effect of a concept-driven revolution is to explain old things in new ways. The effect of a tool-driven revolution is to discover new things that have to be explained. And uh, finally, let me thank all the people who have over <clears throat> the years, I mean, contributed. Sarah, Sarah de Albert, uh, together with uh, Ben Engel, I think they have done most of the work with Chlamydomonas. I have not talked about Shuazano's work. Felix Boyerlein <clears throat> has done the work on hunting team. Anna Bieber and Christina Capitana are working on autophagy. I've not talked about that. Rados team developed the laser faceplate. Ruben <clears throat> was involved um, together with Zhang Guo, now back in, in Beijing, uh, on uh, the um, polyalanine glycine <clears throat> aggregate material. Friedrich Förster has contributed in many ways to image processing techniques. Julia's work I have shown on the nuclear <clears throat> Periphery, Antonio uh, has developed uh, powerful image processing techniques for segmentation. Jürgen Pletzko has been in charge of many of the technology developments. Matthias Burgess' work has been on <clears throat> the rot outer segments. He's still working on that. And Iris Akata has basically um, done the protosome work. And well, I thank you for your attention. All right. Thank you very much, Wugen, for this phenomenal talk to lead us to look inside the cell this morning is phenomenal and fascinating. 
Uh, in view to the time, uh, we would delay the questions after the next speaker. And I will turn back to Bob to introduce our next speaker. Thank you very much, Wa. Thank you, uh, Wolfgang. Um, very impressive uh, crib data, which is then used for in such uh, powerful ways. Uh, really uh, very impressive. Um, I am uh, very pleased to introduce our physical science speaker, uh, uh, Dr. Nesta Zalusek. Um, who I, I would uh, argue is um, one of the most uh, internationally well-known electron microscopists and recognizable electron microscopists. And uh, I've known Nestor for a long time. He obtained his, uh, his education, uh, putting on his uh, famous hat now, his education at the University of Illinois under uh, Hamish Fraser. And I believe he went to uh, Oak Ridge, uh, on a prestigious uh, postdoc fellowship for a couple of years and then came back uh, and has spent the majority of his career at the Argonne National Laboratory just outside Chicago. Nestor has dedicated his life and his science to uh, what used to be called microchemical analysis and is now nanochemical analysis, either through EDS or by eels. Uh, and uh, uh, in addition to, to his uh, scientific contributions, uh, I think that he, um, perhaps more than anyone, has contributed so much to the Microscopy Society of America and so much to the m, &M uh, annual meetings. Everyone knows that uh, one of the places to meet is at uh, Nestor's Internet Corner uh, in the, uh, uh, where the... Uh, uh, industrial booths uh, are where the sh in the showroom, and this was set up by Nestor in very, very early days when there was uh, uh, com computers were in their infancy. So Nestor has contributed in so many ways to microscopy. Uh, he has uh, gone to laboratories across the world and helped them set up their EDS and, and their chemical analysis systems, and has given a series of talks over many years and received appropriate recognitions from the various societies uh, in um, uh, due to his work. So uh, Nesta, I'm very pleased to introduce you. You've been a very loyal contributor to this EMX symposium, which we appreciate very much. And uh, we're looking forward to what you have to tell us today. Thank you, Bob. Uh, see if I can get this uh, show on the road, but first, uh, let me welcome you all to my office here in Chicago. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I hope uh, you, your families, your colleagues are all safe and secure in these trying times. It's, it's stressful for all of us, uh, but we're going to make our way through it and get a shot. Wear a mask if you need it. Okay. But now let's see now if I can share a screen. Uh, we'll get that one and share and it rolling. Okay, I think we've got now got a full screen, right, Bob? Good. Okay. So uh, let me uh, begin by, again, welcoming you uh, here to the office in Chicago. Uh, everything's uh, going well here. Uh, I would like to begin by, again, thanking Bob and Wah, who both I've known for a long time, uh, to give the, uh, to have the opportunity to talk to you today about some of the work we've been doing here at Argonne. Uh, let me also acknowledge that I am at Argonne National Lab, like uh, Bob's already told. We're operated by the University of Chicago, and most of the funding for this work has come out of the US Department of Energy and the Office of Science. But at the same time, I'll be talking about collaborative work uh, that I've taken together with uh, colleagues at Oak Ridge, at different universities around the world. Uh, and you'll see the references to those as appropriate. So, uh, and la lastly, let me also give permission to anybody, if you want to photograph or do a screen share of anything, you're welcome to do it. If you don't want to do that, just send me an email and I'll send you a PDF copy of all of these slides. Uh, glad to do that. Okay, uh, let me digress for a moment. And uh, although at, when I, in the early days, when I started doing things at Illinois, I did a lot of work on metals and phase transformations and spectroscopy. Uh, nowadays, I've sort of evolved a little bit, evolved in a sense that I'm interested not only in hard matter, 
but in soft matter. And that hard soft matter characterization in, at Argonne uh, is a fairly complex, uh, broad research community, both of materials people, chemistry, physics, and the life sciences. And we study things like monolayers, 2D materials, interfacial species, defects, functional materials, traditional and photocatalysts, colloids, membrane frameworks, fluids, organic inorganic heterostructures, polymers, hybrid materials. And I'm actually <laughs> slightly getting into the area of very soft materials, namely structural biology and life sciences and medicine. And I'll try to show you a few examples of how we integrate all that together. But let's actually step back a second and ask ourselves, regardless of what we're looking at, what are the basic questions that we ask ourselves? You, you heard a bit about that from Wolfgang. We want to know the state of a material. What's its morphology, its crystallography, its elemental and chemical structure, or what's the bonding electronic structure? We're very interested in static structures versus dynamic structures. So we're interested in the temporal evolution, whether it's a temporal evolution just by time, or it's influenced by temperature, stress strain, vacuum, gaseous environments, electromagnetic fields, and also irradiation environments. I've done a lot of work in radiation damage of materials, intentional and unintentional. The key challenges, and I think you've heard a lot of it from Wolfgang's talk today, is we really want to do simultaneous imaging of both hard and soft materials. We want to do in situ observation of real time processes. We're interested in high spatial resolution analysis and, and what that means, depending on the, the problem you're asking and the questions you're asking. And all of this is really limited by radiation damage in the instruments we use, whether intentional or uh, um, not intentional. Uh, you all know, and I don't have to tell you much uh, about the role of traditional microscopy in the end, whether we're in a scanning electron microscope or a transmission uh, system, we're looking at morphological evolution, we're looking at the structures present either by imaging or diffraction. Now, the important thing to me is that imaging and diffraction is not always sufficient. Here are three examples of some work that I'm involved in. Uh, complex phases in aluminum alloys, where we see the microstructure of this is a very complex structure of uh, re rectilinear, round, square, all kinds of different precipitate phases. Uh, looking at vesicles in uh, mammalian eggs, uh, looking at the size shape distribution and how does that change uh, due to different biological processes? Or what about, what are these electron dense bodies that we're seeing in polyamide uh, membranes, uh, what, are what is their role and how do they change things? Are these questions we can answer just by imaging and diffraction? We get a lot, but we don't get everything. And what I clearly the, the answer to that is adding other information other than the imaging and diffraction work. And that's where we start involving uh, my forte, namely information from inelastic scattering events. And the two most prominent in the microscope, but not the only two, are uh, the fact that we can have electron inners. Uh, excitation of inner shell processes, and we either look at electron loss spectroscopy or X-ray energy dispersal spectroscopy. These are not the only two, but these are the two uh, I'm most involved with. Uh, certainly there's Auger spectroscopy, cathode luminescence, and a few others. Uh, today, we're going to actually concentrate mainly on energy dispersal spectroscopy. And why do I want to do that? Uh, first of all, it's, it's relatively simple, uh, so to speak, uh, simple and depending on your perspective. Now let's look at an example of that. Uh, here's another example of some work that I'm uh, involved with. This is a uh, type 709 steel. It's an image. It's this kind of steel is used in uh, uh, nuclear materials, nuclear reactors and the like. And we see it's a very complex microstructure. Uh, looking at that complex microstructure, can we understand the morphology of what's going on there? Well, this is certainly very complicated. Can I get imaging of each of the various respective features in this? Yes. Can I analyze this particular image? It's going to take me quite a bit of time. On the other hand, if I make use of not only the elastic scattering, which gives rise to this image, but the inelastic scattering, I can take that image and become that image by just simply looking at the secondary information that's generated by the inelastic scattering events. Now, if I go back and forth, I can see that this 
series of grain boundary precipitates are silicon carbides, silicon and molycarbides. We see chrome carbides in it. We see small niobium precipitates in it. All of that helps us when we go back to look at the overall microstructure. So the two of these combined allow us to elucidate what's going on. So how do we maximize the information we can get from this? Okay, And that's been part of the work I've been doing over the years. Uh, one of which is how do we maximize our detectability and maximize the quanti quantification capabilities of any measurement? And whether you're looking at an image or spectroscopy, we're basically looking at an intensity. And that intensity is dominated by the scattering probability that causes it, the number of atoms that are in, involved in the interaction, how many electrons we put in, how much time we put in there, and how what's the of the process by which we're measuring that intensity. And that holds whether we're looking at an electron image, electron diffraction pattern, or any spectroscopy. That's a generic formula. Now we can take that formula and act, oops, sorry, take that formula. And why isn't it going to the next slide? There we go. And we can, uh, I see what's going on. Okay, we can define based on that intensity, two parameters that are of interest to, to us, the minimum detectable mass and the minimum mass fraction. And both of those are inversely proportional to the intensity of the signal we're trying to measure. And again, that holds whether we're looking at an electron image, a diffraction pattern, or any kind of spectroscopy. Okay. And what I'd like to do is explore how can we maximize that intensity that we're measuring? Now, in the electron imaging case, we all know about the new detectors that are coming out. Wolfgang's alluded to them uh, very nicely. I'm going to change gears a little bit, and I'm going to talk about the intensity due to a spectroscopic signal. And that spectroscopic intensity, I sub A, I alpha, is proportional to some physical parameters due to the electron solid interaction and what signal we're measuring. In this case, the, the cross section for the ionization of the material, any radiative partition functions and distribution functions, the number of atoms in the material and the volume we're analyzing, uh, the beam current, the analysis time, and our collection efficiencies. Okay. Now, if we focus in now, rather than talking about EDS and EELs, I'm going to just focus now for the rest of our discussion today about EDS. Uh, because that's where some of the latest and newest advances have come in. And uh, so we're, what I'm interested in is we really define our experiment by the parameters of the instrument, which affect the physical processes that go on, the cross-section fluorescence yields, the number of atoms we're not going to change, that's the volume of material, the beam current and time we can an analyze. But of all of these, the things that we can improve on without destroying the sample is really our collection efficiencies. So can we improve that? Can we make that better? And how does it affect our analysis? So years ago, I, I did this simple calculation showing the collection efficiency as a function of detector design. And this is again, designed mainly for X-ray spectroscopy where we put a detector near a sample. It's a certain distance away, it's a certain size. And we can measure our collection efficiency as a function of various parameters, okay? Now, I'd like to give you, go back in history a bit here. Let's go back to when I was at least first starting doing some of this work when I was back at U University of Illinois. And the collection efficiency of the detectors we used back then was less than a hundredth of a steradian. It was about a tenth of 1% collection efficiency. And back then I was ecstatic when we were able to measure an X-ray spectrum from a sample. Over the years, those detectors using basically lithium drifted silicon detectors slowly got better. We went from a tenth of a percent to four tenths of a percent up to about the 1% level. Then we had a new technology came in. It's the silicon drift detectors. That happened around the late 90s. And our detecting efficiencies jumped dramatically. We're upwards of five to 8% collection efficiency. Today, you could go out on the market and actually get new detectors that are upwards of 10 to 12% efficiency. And back around 2010, the world's highest collection efficiency detector, the Pi steradian detector at Argonne uh, was established. And we actually got an RD100 award about that. All right. Now, over the intervening years, what has happened is commercially, you can go out and see a wide variety of X-ray detection geometries. We can go from single detectors, which are small round ones or rectilinear ones. We can get arrays of detectors, either pairs of detectors, either side or front to back. 
or even quad detectors. Now, all of these are still limited by the geometry of the instrument. So one of the challenges and one of the roles here at Argon is not only can we do the science, but can we improve the science and improve the technology. Uh, that R&D 100 uh, detector, the Pi Steradian detector, uh, has induced us to go one step further. We now have a new technology that we're what at Argon we call the X-ray perimeter array detector. That X-ray perimeter array detector, the details of which can you can find basically in a uh, patent that was uh, issued a few years ago. But we've gone even one step farther, and with a CRADA here at Argon. We've partnered with Thermo Fisher Scientific Instruments. So we've designed a new detector called the XPAD, uh, which was designed uh, by Argon, but it was engineered by Thermo Fisher. And I'm going to show you some of the results of that new detector technology today and how it influences the science that we can do today. OK, uh, let me give you a, a couple of quick examples of that before we actually use it. Uh, and I'm going to do that by comparison with old technology. I'm going to take now the same sample same type of sample and do a test measurement. And I'm gonna do a test measurement on using a conventional single detector, some dual detectors and some quad detectors and also the XPAD. So if we first go to a conventional single 60 square millimeter detector, that's a good detector. You can go out and buy them commercially today and we can measure the counts per nanoamp per second. And I'm doing a standard test sample here of germanium. Let's not worry about that. Uh, details of which can be found in the references down below. And we're going to call that a factor of one. Now let's take that same type of sample and measure it in the next generation. That is a multi-build detector system, namely the quad detector, or sometimes called the super X detector. It's four 30 square millimeter detectors surrounding a sample. There's a significant improvement, right? Almost a factor of four. Not quite a factor of four, even though this is one detector, this is four. The size of the detectors are different. The geometry is a little bit different, but it's a significant improvement four times the signal. All right, now let's go to the newest technology, namely the, uh, the XPAD. And we go from 1X to 3.6X to 22 times. That's a bit of a jump, okay? Um, think about what you were doing before, what you used to do in an hour, you can now do in 20, 120th of that, okay? So five minutes, okay? Um, how much is this in real in reality? The reality is this is an, uh, a relative measurement. Let's give you an absolute measure now. We can get an absolute measure of the solid angle or collection efficiency. I can write this equation down for those of you that are interested. Uh, we saw this equation earlier. I just inverted it, right? I'm solving for the solid angle, knowing all the parameters of a measurement. And I can go to my single 60 square millimeter SDD detector. I can measure the integrated counts per nanoamp per second. I know the cross sections. I can figure out what the solid angle is. And if you remember that curve I told you before, we were somewhere around 0 0.1, 0 0.2 steradians. Uh, that's, that's right. It's about the value we get. Okay. Let's go to the quad detector systems now. Okay. Again, the same sample, measure the counts per nanoamp per second. We see the count rate has increased uh, close to a factor of four, not quite. The solid angle has also correspondingly increased. We've gone from about 0 0.15, 0 0.2, upwards to around 0 0.6, 0 0.7, okay? The new dual detectors, the new dual detectors we get out now, again, about another factor two on top of that, and the cross-section increases well above a steradian now. And again, depending on the specific geometry and whose detector you're using, we're getting upwards over a steradian. Again, remember when I first started doing this work, we were talking about a tenth of a steradian. Now we're talking about things about one steradian. And now let me end on the XPAD. So these are some results I did uh, just earlier this year. This is the new XPAD geometry. We're going from what used to be a tenth of a steradian, we're upwards of four and a half steradians now. That's a significant improvement in our ability to do work. Um, um, this is uh, what I would call a reasonably good improvement over time. And what I'd like to do now is give you some sense of, okay, there's the technology. And I didn't tell you a lot of the details of the technology. Some of it you could read in the patent. Some of it is covered under intellectual property, so I can't tell you a lot. Uh, be happy to tell you whatever I can. <laughs> but some of the lawyers have told me that I can't talk about certain things. So please, you know, please understand that. Okay, let's go back now and talk about applications of this new technology 
to uh, problems in, mater in materials and actually in hard and soft matter science. I'll remind you about this slide. We talked about detectability is based on a signal measurement. So how does this increased ability to measure signal improve our detectability of anything? And I remember what I'm interested in is maximizing the intensity or maximize in terms of the minimum detectable mass or in terms of minimum mass fraction, maximizing the intensity times the peak to background ratio. Both of these are important parameters. They depend very strongly upon the samples you're looking at and the geometries. Uh, let me just give you an example of the improvement of minimum detectable mass now. I did a very simple experiment. All of you can do this. I take single nanoparticles of gold. We can measure the size of that particle. We can put it in the beam. We can support it on a substrate. So I know the size of the particle. I know the area being illuminated. I know the total mass of the particle in the background. And I can measure the uh, minimum, the mass fraction that's contained in there. So if I had just a nanoparticle by itself with nothing else, uh, the mass fraction is 100% or one, okay? So what I've done is I've taken that same nanoparticle and I measured it at different aerial sizes. So I made pro bigger, kept the same nanoparticle in view. And so the minimum mass fraction that it's occupying is getting lower and lower. We can see with a conventional detector, we're going down to the 10 to minus three range. As soon as we go to the X pad, which is with its higher efficiency, right? And remember it goes as the square root of the intensity. So we're getting almost a factor of 10 improvement in terms of minimum mass fraction, 10 times better than we could before. In terms of uh, uh, looking at very small features, we want the minimum uh, detectable mass. Uh, if I remember, uh, there was a talk uh, last year, somebody wanted to look at dislocations and look at the composition change on a dislocation. Now, I don't have that per se, this is the closest thing I, I had to that example. So I went through my archives. This is some, again, some work done on the new expat. You see dislocations, this is a uh, precipitates in steel, but very specifically at the core, uh, around the cores of these dislocations, you'll see a shadow or an envelope of material uh, uh, being distributed. Question, what is that? Well, we can go in and again, using uh, hyperspectral imaging, we can map those out. And I'll point out to you that these images were taken where I spent 13 milliseconds, no, sorry, 14 milliseconds per pixel around these precipitates. Not a very long period of time. Now, of course, this particular, sorry, I keep pointing with the wrong thing. This is a very large image, a 2K by 2K image. But if we zoom in on any one of these dislocations and look at that diffuse uh, redistribution of elements around that, it's only taking uh, seconds, less than seconds to do that uh, analysis. So the ability of measuring very small concentrations, and very small precipitates are, are there. Of course, there's always the microscopist pain, that is radiation damage. I, I don't have to tell any of you, particularly those of you in the life sciences and deal with soft matter all the time that we have to worry about that. And certainly in material science, we work about it too. And we know there are several, different types. There's knock-on or displacement damage, there's radi radiolysis or ionization damage, and also the secondary electron damage. And that manifests itself by a bar wide range of phenomena. We can get atomic displacement, we can get sputtering, we can get melting, we get amorphization, we get a mass transport and mass loss. Uh, we get uh, crystalline materials going amorphous. And we will look at the electronic structure, we see changes in either the low loss structure, the core loss structure, or if we're doing x-ray microanalysis, we see mass loss in terms of the x-ray emission. So all of this is important. I'm not gonna spend any time talking about that. If you're interested, there's an excellent uh, bit of work by Ray Edgerton uh, in Micron that you can look up. But what I'd like to remind everybody about is the radiation units that we're interested in, okay? Uh, radiation units, depending on what community you're in, whether you're in the x-ray community or the electron community, the X-ray community likes to talk about grays. We like to talk about electrons per square, square angstrom or whatever. I think the important parameter that I like to remember is one picoamp in one microsecond is six electrons, okay? And if we take that and we multiply it by the area of the beam, we can get a number for the number of electrons per square angstrom. So picoamp times a microsecond is six hundredths of an electron per square angstrom if we have a hundred nanometer beam, okay? 
Uh, I tend to do most of my experiments nowadays in the range of 10 to 100 picoamps and a range of a few microseconds to upwards of a few hundred microseconds. So the kind of dose that we're uh, using, depending on the size of our probe, is somewhere in the order of a few electrons per square angstrom to several thousand electrons per square angstrom. Okay. Now, material scientists are spoiled. Okay. We're spoiled because we can look at metals and ceramics and look at them and put a pretty large dose on them. Okay. Uh, here's one of my favorite materials from back in the days when I was at U of I, and uh, the sample is actually uh, a part of a single crystal that Hamish gave me years ago. I never throw anything about away. Uh, and I still have this, some of these samples. This is beta nickel aluminum. Um, if we look down the 001 axis, we can see an ordered array of nickel and aluminum atoms. Uh, we can do an HADF image of it. This is a single frame capture uh, where we're spending uh, a few hundred microseconds per image. And at the same time, we can acquire with the XPad at 400 microseconds per pixel, which is pretty quick a complete hyperspectral image. And of course, if I do multiple frames, I can average it out and get a little bit better. Now this particular, this particular image is oversampled. It's oversampled because I'm doing uh, 26 picometers per pixel. I don't need anywhere near that. I can instead uh, spread my beam out a little bit. I don't need such a uh, high definition of that. But the important thing I want you all to realize that typical, this, is, this would be a typical dose for a hyperspectral image 50 picoamps at 400 microseconds, that's pretty low dose in terms of material science. But if you convert that, and assuming we have a one angstrom probe, that's a fairly high dose. Now, of course, if I spread my dose, my beam out a little bit, I can keep that dose or do less sampling, my dose rate will get far lower. Why am I interested in that? Because I want everybody to realize when we go from metals and ceramics down to biological systems, we have to be very careful with that, particularly in terms of spectroscopy. And I'm gonna show you a few examples of that. And let me go give, start with one example of that. This is a polyamide uh, filtration nanomembrane. So it's an organic membrane. Uh, what you're looking at is the polyamide is folded. Uh, we see the folds in the material. This is a holy carbon film, there's a hole, and the polyamide film is spread over that. Just like Wolfgang, uh, we do electron tomography of this. We do electron tomography to see the shape of those folds. But more importantly, what we're interested in is the use of this membrane. And the use of this membrane is in filtration. So in filtration, when we look at it, we see dense bodies. And the question we wanna know is what are these dense bodies? These are not crystalline. So you can't do simple electron diffraction to figure out what they are. What we want to do is actually do elemental spectroscopy to find out what they are. So we can go then and do the tomography to do the shape, and we can do the uh, spectroscopy to find out what elements are present. And is there a correlation of the metal ion absorption with site-specific geometries? And we can actually begin to see that now. Now, of course, the first thing that people are going to ask us is, what about radiation damage, uh, particularly of polyamides? And so what we do now is position tagged spectroscopy. Just like in uh, cryo-EM, we do images as a function of time. Here we do spectroscopy as a function of time. So I do multiple, instead of taking one very slow scan, I do hundreds of scans at very low dose. Uh, and it requires a spectrum at every point, okay? And what we can do is look at, here's an initial image of one of those polyamide membranes. Here's a spectra taken at a, in a 10th of a millisecond per pixel, not much data, but we can do repeated frames and go from a 10th of a millisecond to one millisecond to 10 to 33 milliseconds. And now we can see that the correlation question, is this structure representative of what was originally there? So here's the original image, there's the microanal microanalytical structure. And I can see as a function of time, I can look for elemental species moving, okay? So I can tell that, yes, all of these features that we see here were present even at the very short time scans, okay? So we're doing dose fractionation, just like you do in uh, tomography. We're doing dose fractionations. We do multiple frames over short periods of times. And we store all of the data 
as a function of x, y, z, e being energy of the spectra and time. Okay. And that means we can go to that polyamide membrane and now map out very carefully and with confidence the heavy metal absorbance on this uh, polyamide film. And we, we can see the interplay between the nanostructure of the film and the chemical elemental or the elemental species that segregate. Okay, in this case, copper, zinc, and, and lead. Okay, so let me now take you from metals and ceramics and polyamides to, to a little bit of biology. Uh, I've been, uh, again, I'm not a biologist, I'm a tame physicist, maybe. <laughs> I'm certainly never a metallurgist. Uh, part of the work I've been working uh, on with colleagues in this case uh, uh, at Northwestern University, we're interested in uh, xenopus vesicles because they undergo massive changes before and after fertilization. We can see the change in the small versus the large vesicles uh, in the membrane as we go before in an egg state or fertilized state, there's a huge change. Question, is there anything else happening besides the morphological changes, the redistribution of the vesicles? And very specifically, is there an elemental redistribution? Again, we can do those measurements. Here's an example of, there's a vesic, uh, this is the redistribution in the cortical components. We're gonna zoom in on those vesicles. Not only can we do our imaging, but I can map out very specifically the trans, in this case, to me, metal compounds, phosphorus, sulfur, chlorine, calcium, uh, iron, cobalt, copper, zinc, manganese, uh, what else was there? Nitrogen and oxygen is, is there for energy. So we can map out that distribution. We can see that what's happening between this uh, at, before and after fertilization is a massive change in the zinc composition. The zinc is going somewhere else. It's leaving the cell. And once it leaves the cell, uh, the, uh, the egg is now fertilized and it blocks further fertilization. Okay. Uh, similarly, doing things in situ and dynamic, you all know is important. Uh, looking at things in liquids or in gaseous, watching the morphological changes, the uh, distribution or shifting of particles uh, in liquids is nice. But in addition to doing that with the right holders and the right stages and the right detectors, we can not only look at something, we should be able to go forward, we can look at nanoparticles distributions in liquids and map out the relative distribution of these. Uh, we can look at corrosion in um, steels. Uh, this is some work done with, with Gracie Burke where we're looking at manganese sulfide dissolutions in water, or we can look at the reactions of either uh, il ilmenite reduction at high temperature of high, in hydrogen or catalysts redistribution at high temperatures. Um, in this case, seven at, uh, 0 0.7 atmospheres of hydrogen between room temperature and 500 degrees. And those of you with very good eyes will see that the uh, palladium in this particular catalyst is staying fit uh, still, but the copper is moving and segregating. Okay. So all of that put together, uh, takes me to what I would call the characterization wish, wish list. Uh, many of you will have seen, I, I've given this, this particular slide many times before, and it changes subtly with time. Uh, what are we looking for as metrologists, which is what we are, we are we're doing measurements, we're doing measurement science. Uh, what we'd like to have is an imaging resource that has resolutions from millimeters to sub angstroms. And you notice I've given this a green check mark here. Do we have that? Yes. Between the optical microscopy, the scanning electron microscopy, the ultra high resolution um, uh, electron microscopy and TEMs, we have that. Now, what we'd also like is an imaging resource with spectrographic contrast, okay? And we're pretty close to it there. Uh, the new advances in detectors that are being used on the electron spectrometers, as well as some of the new advances I showed you today when the new detectors, uh, the X-ray perimeter array detector for EDS analysis and the analytical microscope are getting us there. So can, it, can anything be improved? The answer is yes. Uh, can that green get a little bit brighter? Certainly. Uh, just like we can have better face plates and better electron detectors, we can certainly have better X-ray detectors too and improve our electron spectroscopy also. Okay. We want things that are capable of measuring dynamic processes. That's a challenge, okay? Um, and the challenge is the time scale. 
you have to ask yourself, what, what time scales are we looking for? Do I want to try to do elemental spectroscopy at the picosecond level, or am I interested in milliseconds or nanosecond, nanoseconds, microseconds, or seconds or hours? Depends on the process you're doing. So we can do some of this, but can we do all of it? No. Okay. We'd like to have instruments capable of environmental conditions, namely in operando. Uh, are we going to be able to get much better than one atmosphere? Eh, probably not, uh, not to, and not and retain uh, the resolution that we would like. Uh, time scales, eh, they're going to get, they're going to be moving down. Uh, right now, we're in the millisecond regime for in situ operando uh, liquids in the TEM. Milliseconds is doable. Um, Sub milliseconds is coming. Nanoseconds, eh, I'm not sure we're going to be able to do everything we need to do at nanoseconds and still retain things. We'd love to be quantitative in all mode. And if anybody says we are, uh, they're fooling themselves, right? We are semi-quantitative. We are quantitative in some modes, but not in all modes. So, but can we get better? Certainly. Uh, would we want it to be non-intrusive and non-destructive? Yes, we would. Can we get there? Not in all cases, okay? Uh, we'd like it applicable to hard and soft materials. I think I've shown you a few examples of that today. We are certainly, uh, extending the range uh, that we've done in materials to uh, soft materials and uh, even softer biological materials. And I like to think we're getting there. Uh, we need to be able to do it multidimensionally, X, Y, Z. So we've got lateral dimensions, tomographic dimensions, time, and also spectroscopy and multimodal component. You've heard uh, Wolfgang talk about this. He wants uh, light microscopy in addition to FIB, in addition to TEM. And certainly we want the same sort of thing uh, in uh, material science or in hard soft matter science. And we have to ask ourselves, what is the question we're asking and what do we need to solve that problem? Uh, don't fool yourself. You're never gonna build, build a machine that does everything. What you're gonna build are, in my perspective, electron optical beam lines, just like you have X-ray synchrotron beam lines. You're gonna have a beam line dedicated to a certain suite of problems that we can deal with. We have the same thing in synchrotron science as we do in electron optical science, okay? Uh, and that's my correlation now with the Photon Sciences Director here at Argonne. I'm trying to bring those two communities together a little bit. Okay, so I think uh, I'm gonna try to finish up here. Uh, the capabilities for hard matter, uh, X-ray spectroscopy has been significantly improved. And I think I've given you some examples of soft matter EDS where it's now practical. Uh, again, here's that example of vesicles uh, in the Xenopus. You can see that particular vesicle not only was in a matrix, uh, but we see the phosphorus and the calcium. And in the background, we see the small iron distribution from the part of the sample prep at the 20 nanometer level, okay? Uh, the new detector geometries are present. I'd encourage all of you to talk to the various vendors, all of them, uh, not just Thermo Fisher, but Hitachi, uh, Tescan, uh, JOL, all have very good geometries. Uh, investigate what they have available to them because the opportunities are, are there. Uh, Collection angles are increasing. I've shown you today the world's highest collection angle uh, system at four and a half steradians. Uh, you can get things that are close to that. Again, you go to the various uh, vendors uh, to look to see what they have available. Uh, we are now in the regime, not only of doing a temporally resolved imaging, but temporally resolved hyperspectral imaging. Um, although we're not at the nanosecond. Uh, regime. We're in the uh, microsecond regime for the hyperspectral imaging. Certainly, I routinely run nowadays at time, uh, time scales where I'm taking data at EDS data at the eh, 10 microsecond to 100 microsecond per pixel regime. Okay. Low dose and controlled dose data acquisition is essential. We're doing that not only in cryo EM, we're also doing it now in uh, hyperspectral imaging. So just remember that uh, new and optimized holders are will be essential for this. Uh, at, I was talking to Wah a little bit earlier. He said, oh, you really want to do uh, cryo EM uh, and EDS. Well, I, I have a custom built cryo tomography EDS holder made out of beryllium, cryo transfer even <laughs> holder. I mean, that. So we're going into that regime to do that. Okay. So with that, I'll just remind you, if you can't detect it, then you can't measure it. So answering today's question all starts with gathering the data. So with, with that, let me thank you all and uh, happy to answer any questions if anybody's still around.
Cheers, everybody. And remember, wear a mask if you need it. Cheers. All yours, Dave. Or who is it? Wow. And uh, Robert. Uh, great. Uh, wonderful. <laughs> Thank you for that great overview, uh, Nesta. So um, let's see. We are uh, running short of time here. So I think for the formal session, what I propose is, uh, Wa, would you like to choose uh, one question for uh, Wolfgang? And then um, uh, I can choose uh, one question for Nesta. And then I believe that uh, we uh, continue in an informal fashion uh, without the recording. Is that uh, what we normally do, uh, Raphael? Okay, let me start a question to Wugan for your phenomenal talk. And uh, his questions raised about, are there any technological advancements which would allow us to get to high resolution in situ structure of tiny receptor proteins, say uh, 500 uh, and some phenomena perhaps? So what are the technology you think are the most urgent one at the moment? Well, I think, uh, <clears throat> I think it, it really depends. I mean, for tomography, I think um, it's the most important <clears throat> advance would come from improving contrast. So I think uh, that is the hope with the laser faceplate, because I mean, there are <clears throat> many things where I think you, well, unlike single particle analysis, where you can concentrate the molecule you're interested in, and you have always enough copies I mean, for, for averaging, I mean, the situation in tomography is very different. You have low abundance proteins where you might have in a single tomogram, maybe one copy. So <clears throat> I think that is um, a serious limitation. You are dependent on the abundance, I mean, dictated by nature. And so I think uh, the, the main improvement is currently, I think really, I mean, to, to improve contrast <clears throat> well, which also means, of course, I mean, bringing detectors to the limit where they are not yet. But I think maybe also the, the, the other <clears throat> area where I think we can benefit from is on the image processing side. So, I mean, there are many opportunities coming from artificial intelligence. So that's, that will be a cocktail of solutions to make that possible in your opinion that is not only one which yeah. solved the, yeah okay i agree all right that's good okay other so, well let's let me ask nesta then uh, the um, you concentrated uh, really on eds uh, but uh, you did mention eels which is also extremely powerful so uh, for these uh, sorts of detectabilities, um, how does EELS compare to EDS, and what is your sense about um, e e about uh, that that comparison? Well, if you would have asked me that question ten years ago, I would have said there is there is no competition between EELS and EDS in ultra thin samples. Okay, EELS is the, always the winner for very thin samples, but the problem was ten years ago our our soliding or collection efficiency for EDS was orders of an order of magnitude less. Right now, in realistic samples, I think the two are actually comparable. Okay, um, the peak what limits you in in realistic samples? If we had ultra thin samples, eels always wins. But in the real world, we tend to have samples of finite thicknesses, t over lambdas of around 0.5 to one, and in that regime. EDS and EELS are very comparable. If all you're interested in what elements are present, if you're interested in electronic structure, EELS is gonna win all the time, okay? Because we don't have the energy resolution in EDS than we have in EELS, at least not with the kind of detectors I'm talking about. Can we build detectors like that? Sure, they're the super, super con conducting bolimeters, but the collection solid angles there are too small, so. Uh, Comparable thicknesses, reasonable thicknesses. I think the two are now comparable in terms of elemental spectroscopy. Electron spectroscopy in terms of electronic structure, eels will always win, okay. Thank you. Um, that's, I think that's very useful information for the general audience. And so now I think perhaps we should 
uh, ask the two of you together, um, how do you come together so that uh, what you, Nestor, was, was describing it can be applicable for Wolfgang's situation and vice versa, what Wolfgang was, was uh, deciding, uh, describing uh, uh, can be um, applicable to, to yours, Nestor. So who would like to go first, Wolfgang or Nestor? <clears throat> well, I, th I think... In, uh, in the life sciences, I mean, I, there's a large field, of course, I mean, which will benefit <clears throat> from the methods, I mean, Nestor described that that is biomineralization, okay, which is, I mean, an important field, I mean, but in standard cell biology, I mean, the problem is that, I mean, we have basically carbon, oxygen, hydrogen, and a little bit of phosphor. So, <clears throat> I mean, we are very limited in, in elements, I mean, but there are, of course, areas in biology that would benefit tremendously from, I mean, the method Nestor described. Yeah, I, I would agree 100%. So there's, there's the areas in terms of biological systems that I've been looking at is elemental segregation. So for example, I've been looking at bacteria, um, E. coli, <laughs> and E. coli, where they're sucking up um, minerals, cop, cop, copper, yeah. zinc, and like. Uh, seeing that segregation to com compartments uh, is very important. Uh, the vesicle example I gave you was another one. Uh, but the challenge will be, can we look at uh, electron-dense bodies in uh, some materials, uh, the kind of things that are not necessarily amenable to uh, full-blown full analyses? And I think that's where the two complement each other. And that's always, it's always remember, there is no one technique that's gonna solve all problems. Uh, Wolfgang, you've shown that beautifully. Um, trying to do tomography, would, would I wanna do elemental tomography of a biological system? That's at the moment, not realistic, <laughs> okay? Now, could you do tomography to get the dish, uh, to do something and then do a, a single pass elemental distribution say, okay, here are the various components, that's a hint. I think that's, that's a reasonable thing to try. Okay, um, and that's actually why I built that, had that special holder made. So we're gonna try this, some of that. So uh, cryotomography in, with EDS to see how far can we get. And again, let's also make sure we don't do things, don't be, redi don't be ridiculous. You don't need a one angstrom probe to solve all the problems, right? Uh, increase that probe size to the right, match the probe to the measurement that you're trying to do to the signal you're trying to get. Uh, that's really important. Too many times I see everybody, people he, even here at Argonne, they turn on the machine, they go to the highest possible resolution, the smallest possible probe, and they're trying to do a, an EDS map. And I say, what are you doing? Think about what you're trying to measure. Define the measurements, define the problem, define the measurement you need, the question you're asking, and make the measurement match that question. That's the key. If we don't do that, we're failing. Right, one, one of the basic tenets is that match the probe size to the pixel size, for instance. Yeah. Very simple, but uh, so often ignored because everyone wants the highest resolution, and then, but not necessarily the greatest best detection. Yeah. Um, uh, great. Thank you uh, very much. But the, we are still limited by the manufacturers. They want to sell uh, the cryo EMs uh, separate from the physical science EMs. And, and uh, so th I think there's gonna have to be some, some uh, real change so that, that they become, that you can you do both uh, uh, types of experiments on the same machine. What, what do you sense, why, what you? Uh, I think this is important. I think maybe one step forward to the direction is not to build one machines to accommodate both types of specimen, but at least one type of holders that we can make measurement in A machines and afterward to B machines. I think that will be a step forward. I think that that's an area the industry can be helpful because right now it's very frustrating. If you talk to the, the sales guy in the manufacturers, the sales guy both biological and non-biological are different in general. So I think that I think through the efforts uh, of some of us may bring this into, into a more unifying front, which 
will benefit not only the technology development, but also for the scientists to have a broader view. You see, one of the dangers I see in biology is we get specialized so quickly in order to succeed, we need to focus, we call. But at the same time, as, as Wu can point out is so beautifully that even you see every atom, you may not answer the question exactly how the molecule works. You really need to look at the molecule in context. That is, I think, is so important from high to medium to low resolution. So, so that's one aspect is the instrumentation. I think the other aspect is the data processing. I think that the biology developed this image processing technology, which potentially can be applicable in, in some of the, the problems in, in soft matter or material science. So I'm sure that the material science is somewhat shy away from data processing because we use a very simple weak phase approximation, which is a no-no as I know about it from, for heavy atoms. So, but I think there's maybe some common ground that with the deep learning uh, the methodology that there may be some emergence in that direction it would be truly exciting. Well, the, the other thing that'd be interesting, Hua, is, and, and one of the projects I'm working on here at Argonne is, is called the Water Project. It's the AMUSE program. And we're interested in studying nanoparticles and liquids and the interaction of nanoparticles with, and membranes with surfaces and the like. And uh, admittedly, we're dealing mainly with uh, nanoparticle, relatively hard nanoparticles to start. But now we're starting to modify the, the membranes. We're making custom built membranes, which are made out of polymers. Okay. And then we're starting to coat the polymers with atomic layer deposition processes to put very specific coatings on it. Uh, and also to see what happens environmentally when we actually not only put coatings on material, but also charge those compound, those films. So the question is how can we also apply that to the soft matter life science criteria? There is gonna be a challenge and you, you must correct me when I'm wrong here because to me, a typical cell is a couple of microns thick, <laughs> okay? And realistically, I'm not gonna, uh, while I can make a polymer membrane that's a few nanometers thick, I can't make a cell that's a few nanometers thick. It, I mean, that's no longer a physical process, okay? We, we've now uh, cropped it. So can we develop a te technological solution so that we can begin to get resolution in thicker samples? Are we gonna get 10 microns with electrons? No. That's not realistic, not without destroying the sample, right? But what about something, you know, in the micron range? Uh, somebody, can somebody help me here? Uh, Wolfgang, are, is there anything in the micron range <laughs> that, that uh, you know, one micron range or lower, or are they all in the 10 micron range? Yeah, I, I, I think, of course, uh, prokaryotic cells, I mean, are in the micrometer range. I mean, organelles are in the micrometer range. And of course, you can organize, I mean, you can relatively easily. <clears throat> I mean, isolate organelles, but I mean, whole cells, I mean, a typical eukaryotic cell, as you rightly said, is 10, 20 micrometers in thickness, okay? It's, I mean, there are special cases, of course, axons of, uh, <clears throat> of, uh, of neurons, they are thinner, but I mean, a typical cell is 10, 20 micrometers. Yeah. But in the, I mean, prokaryotic, I mean, whether it's archaea or bacteria, <clears throat> but even a typical, E. coli cell is too thick for tomography, but you can, I mean, force the cells to grow in the form of mini cells and they are then amenable to, I mean, whole cell tomography. Okay. Okay. Yeah, the best, the best I've been able to do is I've been looking at whole bacteria. So I can see the flagella and I can actually see through them, but the resolution uh, uh, starts to get pretty poor. But at least I, I we begin, the whole idea is to look at the whole bacteria uh, look for the elemental redistribution. And then once we've got some idea of what's happening, then start doing cryosections uh, to get things at higher resolution. Okay, there's a question in the audience for Wugan. Uh, can you use uh, uh, cryo-ET to study very small complex like origami or of optic of that sort? 
Yeah, I mean, of course, you can study origamis. I mean, that has been done by many people. I mean, DNA origami as well as protein origami. Um, but I mean, you don't really need tomography for that because I mean, they are designed to be identical. So I think the easier way is to do it by single particle analysis. <clears throat> we are working, we have been working recently on protein origami with the idea of using them because of their distinct shapes as, as labels. They are <clears throat> um, um, contrary to what the designers thought quite a bit more flexible. So um, um, you don't get high resolution really. I mean, you typically get stuck at something like seven, eight angstroms with these protein origami. <clears throat> so I think in principle, you could use then tomography and, and do, I mean, serious classification to, to push it to high resolution. So I also, I have one question also from the audience, uh, from uh, Dr. Dunin Bukowski for Nesta. Uh, prospect of combining EDX with 4D STEM for typographic, typographically uh, obtaining phase information. And then with the XPAD, can you measure the angular distribution of the emitted X-rays? Simple answer, yes to both, already doing it. <laughs> So yes, you can do, uh, so the, the Pico probe system here at Argonne uh, has both uh, the XPAD and also an MPAD. Uh, and so I can do tachography as well as EDS and, and do them simultaneously. So yeah. So what are the prospects for ordinary laboratories to obtain these uh, equipment rather than say uh, Argonne is a special place uh, and uh, so, but how about ordinary laboratories? Can they, do you think they would be able to do similar technologies? Uh, no question, but it comes down to money. Okay. Uh, well, exactly. That's the problem, I think. Okay. <laughs> it, it, it's always down to money. Uh, although in, in the interim, you can always come pay me a visit. <laughs> I'd be interested in collaborating. But no, uh, the, the technology, part of the reason, uh, part of the technology that we do here at Argonne is not only just for Argonne, but it's also to make sure we have it out to the scientific community to solve the greater problems, okay? So all of the technology that we have uh, available here at Argonne is available for outside users to come in with appropriate uh, proposals and the like. But we also communicate that technology to the uh, manufacturing community. As I alluded to, uh, XPAD was a CRADA project, was developed in conjunction with Thermo Fisher. So we did the design, they did the engineering, uh, but it's all based, a lot of it is based on the, the uh, early patents from uh, the Argonne uh, Pistoradium detector. But there's no reason why this technology can't be extended to other manufacturers, not just Thermo Fisher. Thermo Fisher happens to uh, have access to uh, the XPAD technology. Right now it's, it's called uh, uh, Ultra X, is, uh, if, you're in, if somebody's interested in, in touching base with them. But I, that being said, uh, JOL has their dual X detector system. Um, um, Tescan, I'm sure, is coming out with something in the not too distant future. Uh, uh, Gatan certainly has some uh, nice systems uh, coordinating with uh, Bruker to put in uh, very nice detectors uh, into the, uh, the NION systems. So there are, there are a lot of opportunities there, okay? And there are a lot of opportunities for combining them. Just remember, like I said, these are electron optical beam lines, okay? They're not necessarily the instruments that you wanna buy for a routine novice user that doesn't, that isn't experienced in doing it because we're pushing the limits on a lot of these things, okay? Uh, a good technology in conventional machines with uh, off the shelf detectors is available. If you need to push that, push the limits, you certainly can do that, but it's not gonna be without cost. Thank you. Okay, I'd like to make a comment that in biology, uh, we also have these uh, uh, electron microscope resources for biologists to come to collect data. Uh, the National Institute of Health has set up uh, several centers uh, uh, for people who are specimen, then they can prepare the specimen in a frozen state and send it to the center for data collections. Uh, and for tomography, the NIH also set up centers 
uh, to allow people to prepare the frozen to, to learn how to do the focus ion beam and and also uh, and collect the tomography data. So just for the words of advertisements at Stanford Slack, we have uh, these two centers set up that welcome users and these are free of charge. And also the site headed by Bridget Carragher in New York also have these kinds of centers uh, facilities and uh, for the single particle uh, data collections and there's another site over in Oregon uh, Health Science Center uh, headed by uh, Eric uh, Guas. And uh, so I think these are all in our websites that uh, the, the users can uh, get access to uh, uh, about these very expensive uh, instrumentations. Okay, yeah. I have one more question uh, from the audience for Wugan, which is about the focus ion beam. He said, do you see any advantage using the uh, plasma-based uh, focus ion beam source than the gallium source? Yeah, the advantage is, is obvious. I mean, it will be much faster. I said it's uh, 10 to 20 fold faster. I mean, <clears throat> at the same time, I mean, the instruments which will get onto the market, I mean, it will be probably twice the price of a gallium focused ion beam. So it will go up from 1 million to, to 2 million at least. <clears throat> so I think it's, it is important that we keep these things affordable and not only for, I mean, a few centers. And I think, well, for instance, I mean, we discussed uh, earlier this week, I mean, the, the future of, let's say, the, the laser face plate microscope. I mean, you know, I mean, how much it has cost for the Chen Zuckerberg initiative. It has eaten up 40% of the total budget. So the question came up, I mean, what will be the cost of such an instrument if it's um, marketed, for instance, by Thermo Fisher? Olga Müller was optimistic that the price would go down to something like 8 million. Other thing will be something like 10. So that is, I think, not affordable for, I mean, single sites, I mean, it's okay for centers, but I mean, I think in order to, I mean, to be really used in cell biology, I think single particle analysis is somewhat different. You can do that easily, I mean, at, at centers, but uh, that is much more problematic with, uh, I mean, samples for tomography. And I think it's important that we somehow try to keep instruments affordable, I mean, it must be fit the budget of a, of a starting package when, you, when it comes to the appointment of a PI. And That's, uh, uh, an increasing dilemma. <laughs> yeah. I, I think, um, Wa, if you agree, we should um, let our speakers uh, proceed with the rest of the day. Um, I'd like to uh, suggest that uh, we, we uh, have means of keeping the Q&A and the chat, I believe, so that uh, uh, we'd ask the speakers to respond directly, uh, if possible, to, to the Q&A uh, afterwards, uh, please. Um, I'd like to thank Raphael, uh, who's put together so much effort to get this going and presumably helped by uh, Ziwen. But uh, Raphael, I know, has put a, a lot of effort into this. And um, I'd like to thank our great speakers uh, uh, who uh, started off for the new academic year. We'll be back online again November the 1st at uh, 8 a.m. Remember, uh, California time. Uh, and um, uh, Wa, would you like, do you have anything to say, uh, uh, please? And then perhaps the speakers, uh, one sentence each. Uh, Okay, then uh, I'm delighted to have uh, Roger Kornberg from Stanford to be our next speaker in November. And uh, we like to keep on the momentum of this series, which uh, will benefit uh, not only the audience, but the speakers as well. I uh, look forward to seeing you next month. Thank you. Uh, Nesta, then Wolfgang. Well. Thanks, everybody. Uh, enjoyed the talk. I hope you enjoyed it, too. Uh, and as Wa mentioned, uh, not only are there biological centers for doing th things, there are also the corresponding material science centers, both at universities and at the national labs. 
both in the US as well as in Europe and Australia and Japan and China. So uh, they're all over the world. So make, make take advantage of that. Thank you all for your time. I hope you had fun and drop me a line if you're interested to do something. I'm happy to talk to anybody. Thank Cheers, you. everybody. Wolfgang. Thank you very much. I think next time I hope well, we can have it in person followed by a Chinese dinner. Okay, that sounds really good. I look forward. Uh, I don't enjoy, I mean, virtual dinners, even gala dinners. I mean, it's no fun. Okay. I okay. hope we can, we can see all of our participants, uh, hopefully, uh, at meetings, uh, probably in the new year. Yeah, I also look forward a German sausage as well. <laughs> and maybe a yes. beer. And wash down with a nice beer, yes, good. <laughs> right, I think that uh, we should close uh, uh, the recording and uh, perhaps we can just uh, hang on online for a few minutes to say our farewells. <laughs>